All right, let's take our Bibles, please, and go to the book of Genesis. And we are in Genesis chapter 13 now. Genesis chapter 13. Proceeding onward here in the book of Genesis. And we're learning about the life of Abraham. And so last week we learned about his journeys, the journeys of Abraham. And so today we are learning still about the journeys of Abraham, but specifically we're learning about his return to Canaan. And so that's the lesson today. Abraham's journeys, and specifically we're learning about his return to Canaan. God called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees. And uh, he told him to go into the land of Canaan. And he went by way of Haran. He lived in Haran for a time with his family and then went southward into the land of Canaan. And he was there in the land of Canaan, as we learned, uh, from chapter number 12. And there was a great famine that struck the land. And so uh, Abraham, uh, when the famine was great in the land, he then sojourned for a time in the land of Egypt. And in the land of Egypt, he... Uh, had his wife with him and, and uh, told them that she was his sister, and he ran into a little bit of trouble with that. And because of that fear in his heart, he was afraid that he would end up dying because of her, and so he, he made up that story. And so we learned a little bit last week about the result of, of his actions, and that because he had lied about who his wife was, and it, it turned out to affect others, not just himself, but it had a negative effect on other people as well. And so we tried to discover a few things about the choices that we make, uh, how that the effect of them does not just involve ourselves, but also others around us. And uh, Abraham was a godly man, a man of faith, a man of obedience, uh, but of course was, a, was also a human and uh, so we learn from all, all of his life and the things that he did. But when we come to chapter 13, Abram is now having spent time in Egypt. He is now uh, coming back to the land of Canaan. I suppose the famine, I'm sure, had subsided. And so now he's returning to uh, the land of Canaan. We'll look at chapter 13 the first four verses. And here it says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on in his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. I want you to notice a few of the phrases that are mentioned here in verse 3. It says that he went back to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. So notice if you'll mark this or write it down somewhere... Notice in verse 3, the phrase, at the beginning. And then notice in verse 4, the phrase, at the first. At the beginning and at the first. And we're learning tonight about Abram's return to Canaan. And let us just ask the Lord to guide us through this lesson. We need the Lord to guide us. Father, give us, I pray, the words to be spoken. And may your Spirit guide us, Lord. Prepare our hearts and minds, please. And, Father, may this be something to be of a great help to us. And we ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, and for his sake. Amen. When Abram is on his journeys, he sojourns in many places because he comes from his nativity in Ur. He then goes to Haran, where he lives for a time, then to Canaan. God had told Abram when he was in Ur of the Chaldees that he wanted him in Canaan. He said, there is a land there that I'm promising to your seed after you. Now, did Abram have any children at this point? He did not. He had no seed. He had no child, no son uh, to propagate the seed. But 
Abram was promised by God that his seed would inherit that land. And so Abram is just going simply by faith on the promises of God. That's all he's doing, just going on faith by the promises of God. Because God said that you will have a seed that will inherit the land of Canaan. And so he continues on, he traverses through that land with that goal in mind, that he was going to reach the land of Canaan. And there's detours before he gets there, but eventually when he gets there, uh, he puts his feet on the soil of the land of Canaan. And God says, look northward and southward and eastward and westward and understand that this whole land I will give to your seed. But also it's important to understand that Abraham never actually saw this happen in his lifetime because Abram eventually had a son, but he did not see his seed actually inherit the land of Canaan. So most of the promises of God that he gave to Abram, Abram never saw them come to fruition, never saw them come to pass, but yet believed, right? That's what Hebrews 11 says, that all these died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. So they saw the promises because they believed God, even though they didn't physically did not physically observe the fulfillment of the promises. They still fully believed. He said he was confident that God was able to perform what he had promised. And that's what these men and women of faith believed in the Bible. And so it's one thing for God to promise you something, and then five years later it happens. But some of the things that God promised Abram didn't happen for hundreds of years. Because remember how that... Abram's descendants, when you have Jacob and his 12 brethren, or Jacob and his 12 sons, what happens? They ended up in Egypt. And then the children of, Egypt, the children of Israel languished in Egypt for 400 years. And they did not enter into the land of Canaan till many hundreds of years after this promise was made. And so because of that, uh, we can see that Ab Abram was fully depending on God's promises, on God's word. When God said this will happen, it will happen, uh, even if he did not see it. And when God said to Abram, you're going to have a son, well, Abram didn't have a son until 25 years into the whole thing. He was in the land of Canaan. He did live there. He was in the land of Canaan for 25 years because he gets there when he's 75. Isaac is born at 100 years old. Uh, his handmaid has you know, Ishmael. We know that story, but that's not his heir. And so Isaac comes 25 years later. Um, and so we see once again that Abram is having to wait on the promises of God. But I want us to understand and follow with me, if you can, uh, in, in, in the, the transpiring of the events and the sequence of events that are taking place here. Because Abraham, he's in the land of Canaan. Then there's a dearth in the land. So then he goes to Egypt, and he lives in Egypt for an indefinite period of time, an unknown amount of time. And then what happens? Uh, he's in Egypt, and then he remembers. Well, God promised me Canaan, so he goes back to the land of Canaan. Now, we may ask the question, was it God's will for him to be in Egypt? And I do not know the answer to that. So um, I'm just not even going to say uh, whether it was God's will or not. God never proscribed it. In other words, he never said it was wrong. Uh, he also never necessarily condoned it either. So it's interesting to see Egypt has a very important, uh, very important component in the scriptures because we see Israel in Egypt for years. We see that Jesus Christ went to Egypt. Do you remember that? When he was very young. When Herod ordered all the little boys to be killed, and God, in a dream, appeared to Joseph and says, Take the young child of his mother and flee to the land of Egypt. And then we see in the book of Hosea how God says, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then we see again in the New Testament the fulfillment of that prophecy about Christ uh, when Joseph remembers those words in the Old Testament that says, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And then that's speaking about Christ. So Egypt has an integral part in the fulfillment of Scripture and just throughout the canon of Scripture. 
Uh, it's interesting to me how many times Egypt actually pops up here and there. Alexandria ended up being a pretty major city uh, with even some, some, some biblical, bib, biblical uh, uh, linkages there. And so God used Egypt and he also allowed his people to be there for a time. But nonetheless, Abr, uh, Abram, he sojourns in Egypt and then... Based on what God had promised him, he comes back out and he returns. And so tonight we're talking about that one thing, how that Abram is returning back to the land that God had promised him. And it is a move that we can learn volumes from. Uh, there's much to be learned about this move of Abraham. Because Abram, when he comes back to the land of Canaan, we see some spiritual principles. And as we uh, learn the book of Genesis and study through the book of Genesis, we will learn that there are spiritual principles intermingled throughout the book that we can learn and actually apply to our own lives. And so we see that he comes out of Egypt, he and his wife, in verse 1, and all that he had and lot with him into the south. Now, when he says into the south, He's not saying that Abram went from Egypt to the south of Egypt. When he says the south, he's talking about the southern portion of the land of Canaan. So that means he's actually going north. He's going out of Egypt into the southernmost portion of the land of Canaan. Because he talks about Bethel and Hai, which if you look at a map, that's in the southern part of what we would call Palestine, that area. So south of where Jerusalem would be, and, and very close actually to that region. And so he is going out of Egypt, north, nor, nor, northerly, he's going, taking a northerly route, right into the land of Canaan, and, uh, and it's called the land of the south, because remember, when the Bible speaks geographically, okay, this is important to understand, those of you who've been to Israel would understand this, of course, but you know, when the Bible speaks geographically, something being north, something being south, something being east, it's always with Jerusalem as the north star, as it were. That that's the centerpiece. Jerusalem's the centerpiece. So if you talk about something being north, you're, in the Bible, it's north of Jerusalem. If you talk about something being to the west, like he talks about the Great Sea, well, that's the Mediterranean Sea because it's west of Jerusalem. He talks about places to the east, well, that's most likely the area of Assyria and so on because that's east of Jerusalem. When you talk about south, well, anything south of the holy city, anything south of Jerusalem would be considered south. So he's going into the south, which is the land of Canaan, south of uh, Jerusalem. And so uh, he goes back into the land to Hai and Bethel, where he was before. Now, uh, I just want to make a note about something. Because remember, this is just an interesting tidbit, as it were, because remember how the children of Israel, they dwelt in the land of Egypt for about 400 years, and then they come out of the land of Canaan, excuse me, uh, they come out of Egypt to go to the land of Canaan, right? But what happens? They wander in the wilderness how many years? 40 years. 40 years. But Abraham, it's like it just took a couple days. That's the way it seems. But understand, he's doing the same thing. He's going from Egypt to the land of Canaan. And that's all the children of Israel were to do. But the children of Israel had many lessons to learn, and they were not ready to inherit that land. They were a stiff-necked people. Uh, and God had to really do a lot of things in order to prepare them for that. And so they were not ready yet. But Abram, he just enters right away. I don't know exactly the route he, he went. He may have gone through just that northwestern part of uh, the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, that, it depends on how far into Egypt he went. But uh, he comes back in the land of Canaan. So we learn here that he's returning to the land that God had promised him. I want to give you three points uh, to illustrate and to propound these truths I'm trying to give you. Number one, notice please, simply, very simply tonight, notice number one, the return. Notice please that Abram is returning to the land that he not that he came from, that he grew up in, but the land that God had promised him that he had wandered off of for a little bit. And so, this is an important principle. I want to get to that in a moment. Verse 2, Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver and in gold. He had lots of possessions. Uh, and you know, when he was in Egypt, 
uh, the king of Pharaoh there, uh, he treated him well and gave him all kinds of things. So Abraham had a lot of things. But Abram is returning. Now, the principle that I, I hope we can get across tonight, and I trust God will help us understand it, that this principle is a spiritual principle of life that it is easy to be sidetracked from the true purpose of life. It's easy to be sidetracked from the true purpose of life because of a trial, because of a famine of any sort. It doesn't have to be a famine of bread. It could be a famine in, in the circumstance, circumstances of life. It could be a famine in the resources of life or the provisions of life. So what happens? We get distracted. So I am not making a statement as to whether or not Abraham should have been in Egypt, but I do believe a principle that I believe is, is scriptural and a principle that God wants us to learn is that it's very easy to be sidetracked into Egypt out of Canaan because of a trial. And so he gets, he gets sidetracked, he gets distracted, and then it dawns on him one day. And you may, you, this may seem to be an extrapolation, or maybe this seems to be uh, an assumption, but it seems to me that it dawns on him one day. And he says, you know what? This is not where God really wants me to be. This is not really where I'm supposed to be. Not in the land of Egypt. God has a land, the land of Canaan, which is picturesque of the land and the life that God wants us to live. And he gets sidetracked from that. He goes into Egypt for a little while. And then he, uh, then he comes back and he returns to uh, the land of Canaan. He, he remembers that this is where God promised that he was to be. Miss Nancy? Yes, yes, you're exactly right. I think that's a very valid point that perhaps Abram was taking matters into his own hands uh, rather than just trusting that God would provide the resources that he needs in the land of Canaan. Instead, he goes out of that. He gets sidetracked by the lack of resources. He goes to Egypt. And then, and, and as she said a moment ago, that's exactly what we do sometimes. Uh, we look at the 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 physical state of things, and then we tend to take those into our own hands. When if we would just stay where God wants us to be and doing what God wants us to do, then He would provide everything. Um, and and we mentioned that a little bit last week with the fear that He had uh, that they would take His wife away, or, or specifically His fear was that He would be killed. Uh, but see, God had already promised him that he would have this land. And so he did not need to worry. He did not need to fear that. Uh, but he was sidetracked. He was distracted by those things. By he actually steps outside, I think, of the, the perfect will of God where he should have been uh, because of, of, of uh, a little bit of some worry and fears there. I do believe that Abraham did have some fear. Because not only do we see it here about worrying about his wife and about the famine, uh, but then even in other places he asks God again, can you do something just to show me that this is going to happen? And we can understand that, of course, uh, that we would all want the same thing. But he gets sidetracked. He finds himself in Egypt. But the good thing about Abraham is he realizes, okay, this is not where I'm supposed to stay. This is not where... I am supposed to be, and so he returns back. And the best thing that you and I can do if we realize I've been distracted, I've let the things of life take my attention off what's truly important, I have uh, been distracted from the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose of my life because of something that's taken place, and so let me return back to that. And God has helped me with that because sometimes all the things can really overtake your mind. Uh, everything that's taken place in your life and everything you're trying to just get through uh, can overtake your mind. And it's very, uh, very, very helpful and healthful to just look back and return, even just mentally, to return back to what God has done in your life and think about, I was thinking about today, I, I was in my mind, uh, sometimes, you know, I love how your mind can jump thousands of miles. You know, you can put yourself in some place and I remember the altar. And, you know, you think about the altar that Abraham built here. He built two different altars in the plain of Mori and then in Bethel. And then he builds another one in the plain of Mamre later. But he, it's in Mori, then in Bethel he builds these altars. And these altars are, are as it were, uh, memorials. Those are places where 
Abram encountered God. And what I want to say to you is that many times there are altars in our lives that are memorials and reminders of what God did. So in my mind, I jumped back uh, a couple hundred miles to Winchester, Virginia, where I surrendered my life to serve the Lord. Um, other places I thought about in my mind where I remembered, you know, this is what God called me to, no matter what. Uh, no matter what, uh, what thought I ever encounter, it crosses my mind or your mind, it's indubitably true that I've been called this way. And so I can look back on the altar and the memorial and, uh, and say, let me not be distracted because the circumstances of life can distract me, but let me not be veered off. Help me not to go astray from that because I know that the land of Canaan, as it were, understand just the illustration I'm making here, that the land of Canaan is the calling of God. Remember the first lesson of the life of Abraham? We said it was Abraham's call, right? Abraham's call and Abraham's journeys, and then Abraham's return. So Abraham's call, when we think about his call, his call was go to the land of Canaan. That was his call. So what's your call? What's my call? And my call being to serve the Lord, that's the land of Canaan for me. If I'm in any other land, I'm miserable. Absolutely miserable, unless I'm in the land of Canaan. And if I'm in the land of Canaan, then I'm rejoicing in the Lord, because that's where I'm called to be. And so for you, so for you, God has given you uh, blessings in your own life, and He's called you a certain way, and, and uh, when you get veered off from that, get distracted from it, sidetracked from that, uh, then you'll find yourself uh, just worried about everything, and uh, so concerned with trying to get everything right. And you need to just return back and, and think in your own mind, uh, think in your own mind of those different memorials, those altars, those places along the way. It's, 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 uh, we could call them markers, um, journey markers. It's kind of like uh, I remember a lot of these in Virginia when I, I lived there. There seemed to be historical markers on the road. Some of you have been down to like northern Virginia and places like that. I saw them all over the place. Uh, these, these markers that would say, it would have a label on it, it would say, what happened there? Such and such a year, you know what I'm talking about. It's a lot over there in that area. And, uh, and so you would see these markers, and it would, it would tell you this battle, this Civil War battle or something took place there. What is that? It's a reminder of a major event that took place. And I think that in some way, and I'm still kind of asking the Lord how to do this, but uh, in some way... There need to be some markers set up in our lives. Of uh, This is something God did here. This is something God did here. Now, I have them in my mind. Uh, a certain days, wow, God did something on that day. Something great that day. And maybe I can even remember the date or just remember what happened on that date. But I don't know if there may be more I could do. Uh, something more to be a reminder to constantly, maybe more constantly remind me of that again and again and again. So what are the things in your life, and you could think about it right now, uh, of, of the markers along the way where it was like a memorial, it was like an altar. We see later Jacob's going to come to Bethel as well, and it's an altar. He sets up the, the stones there for a pillar to remind him this is where he met God. So the encounters are places where we meet God. And what you want to do is you want to come back to the place where you met God. Where did you really meet him? Um, I'm not really talking about when you got saved. You could be about that, but maybe there's another time in your life where, where you really just got it and God did something in your life. And remind yourself of that again and again. And when you get distracted and, uh, and veering off the way, as our minds are prone to do, then be reminded of that. Return to the land of Canaan. So, Number one, the return. Number two, we see the remembrance. And this is interlaced into what we just said. The return, the remembrance, he says in verse 3, and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place. Notice this, he goes to Bethel. Now, Bethel is an important place. I like singing a song about that. Back to Bethel I must go. Because Jacob had the same experience. He went on his journeys from the south. So, Remember what I said about the south. That's land of Canaan, south of Jerusalem, and Bethel's near Jerusalem. He go northward, even to Bethel, from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. This Bethel and Hai is east of Jerusalem, closer to the Jordan River, Bethel and Hai. And uh, he says this is where he 
had been at the beginning. So where were you at the beginning of it all? When God really worked in your life, where were you? And uh, can you remember that? Can you remember that experience? Don't forget the experience, but draw encouragement from that experience, how God met you uh, in that way. So the remembrance. Bethel was a place of memorial. What is it that you and I need to remember, uh, remind ourselves about? Don't forget those amazing works that, that God did where his tent had been. And we look back at verse 8 of chapter 12. This is what it harks back to. And we can actually look at verse 7 and 8 of chapter 12. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So Abram built an altar at that place where God appeared to him and promised him his seed would possess the land. Then verse 8, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. He really just yielded himself to God at that place. And I still remember the place where I did that. So it's a place that we want to return. Even if we don't return in person to that, I I think I'm going to return in person one day. But... Even if we don't return in person to that place, still, I, I do think that it's a mindset of being reminded of this is where God broke through. Amen. This is where He did a great work. And uh, God's broken through a couple of times. And I can think of that. I was pretty stub- stubborn for a while, and uh, still am, I guess. Uh, but the truth of the matter is I know that He broke through. Uh, a few different times, and we thank God for that. Amen. And uh, some of our heads are a little, little hard at times. And so, but he has a pretty strong drill, too. So he gets in. But be reminded, let me ask you a question. Think about it this way What is your Bethel? Just think about it. I, I don't know the answer for you. I think I know the answer for me, but I need to think about it a little bit, too. What is your Bethel where God worked? At the beginning. It's like at the inception of the whole thing. The beginning of it. Think about that word beginning. We're studying the book of what? Genesis. Genesis. Just to make sure we're all on the same page there. Book of Genesis, right? That's the book of beginnings. Origins. He says at the beginning. At the beginning. Hey, it may have been 20 years ago. It might have been 50 years ago. It might have been 10 years ago. I don't know how many years ago it was. But at the beginning, what is your Bethel? It's a great question to ask and ponder, to ruminate on a little bit. The return, the remembrance, and lastly, we see the rededication. The rededication. He is reminded of Bethel, uh, specifically what God did there. He goes back to Bethel between Bethel and Hai, to this place where his tent was. Verse 4, it says, Unto the place of the altar. Here it is again, the altar. The altar is a symbol of sacrifice, dedication, surrender, and consecration. It's a place of dedication, surrender, consecration. A place where we are reminded of how we gave ourselves to the Lord. Have you ever done that? Fully? given it all to the Lord, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. So remember I said at the beginning, I asked you to mark those or make a note of them. At the beginning and then at the first because we need to look back to what happened in the beginning because that's that's really where it's all started was when God really began to work. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there, here it is again, Abram called on the name of the Lord. That's exactly what he did when he was there in the previous chapter. Chapter 12, verse 8. He called upon the name of the Lord. Here it is again. It seems to me he's coming full circle. He starts there. He calls on the name of the Lord. He gets distracted. He takes kind of a detour. And then he comes around. And the great thing about Abraham... Great thing about Abraham is not that he was a perfect man, but that when he get to get well, let's see if I say it right one day. 
But the good thing about Abraham is when he did get distracted, he came back around. He came back around. And he remembered it. See, the problem with the worst problems that people encounter, now I believe this all in my heart, people get themselves in the worst pickles, the worst messes imaginable, because they get distracted and never come back. They just stay distracted the rest of their life. Uh, someone once said that mankind has an infinite appetite for distractions. Think about that. An infinite appetite. You ever see how long people just spend like this all day? And I'm not saying I'm, I'm not even saying that I'm guiltless because um, there's all kinds of stuff we can be distracted by. But I'm just saying that you could live your whole life on distractions and never get anything accomplished. You just go from one distraction to the next. That's a danger. Because what can happen then is that you never come back to where you ought to be. You never come back to where you ought to be. So the good thing about Abraham, and I believe one of the reasons God could trust Abraham with this great promise, is because God knew Abraham's not a perfect man, just like none of us are, but that he would come back. He would come back. He got distracted. He got a little fearful. He took it into his own hands a little bit. But he returned to Canaan. And uh, he remembered it. And then what did he do? He rededicated. Rededicated. Because he comes to the place of the altar. The altar. By the way, all of us need that at times. doesn't matter who we are. Coming back to the place of the altar where he had been at the first, that he made at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, those are the same words that used in verse 8 of chapter 12. He called upon the name of the Lord. So it seems to me that he's rededicating himself. He's yielding himself once again, saying, I know I got distracted, I got off the beaten path a little bit, but I yield myself again to the Lord. And sometimes we need to say, I just yield myself afresh, Again, to the Lord, rededicate. Maybe you've been distracted. Well, it's never too late just to rededicate. Now, how are we going to do that? The best way to do it is by remembering what he did the first time before you got distracted. What was it that he did that really caused you to dedicate your life to him before the distractions begin to come? And then think on that. And then rededicate yourself. So, uh, what a great spiritual truth we're finding here. The return, the remembrance. He's remembering what God did, and then he's rededicating himself. And, um, you know, we don't normally do invitation times on Wednesday night, but we're going to have a time where I want to ask you to pray and uh, ask the Lord to, to help you and help me to rededicate. That's what we need to do. If we need to do that, rededicate to what he did at the first at the beginning. That's what you need to think about. At the beginning. Hey, eschew all the distractions. Just forget about them. Forget about them. All the distractions. And uh, they'll be there. Trust me, they're not going anywhere. But you can keep your mind on the Lord and keep your mind on what God has called you to and what He said to you. And don't let those distractions take the focal point away. See, the focal point is where you place your focus on. And uh, there's a lot of peripheral things, isn't there? If you're looking through binoculars and you see something you're looking at, there's always all kinds of different things. But if you want to see what you're looking at, you've got to keep your eyes on that. And don't worry about the other things. Keep that focal point on the Lord, what He did at the beginning, at the first.